Well, hello, I'm Janet Marana, Executive Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to Just Ask Janet. And of course, we are continuing our discussion of the Dobbs case, the overturning of Roe v. Wade Planned Parenthood. And joining me, of course, is our National Director, Father Frank Pavone. Father, welcome to this great right. discussion. Good we're to be for, uh, ready for another se another session of this, another this session. class. If That's you right. And I want to remind everybody uh, that our classes and all our support information is constantly being put up on SupremeCourtVictory.com. That's mm -hmm. the one-stop shopping. That's where you go, SupremeCourtVictory.com. And uh, like I said, when we're finished this full set of classes this week, uh, Father will then continue to upload more information, more talking points. And by the fall, we're going to come out with a great brochure, almost like a booklet, uh, if it needs to be, where we'll have more explanation, but we will have just bullet points, too, that you can just have those quick answers for people, Father. Because, you know, so many people, I think, are still trying to figure out what happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're scratching their heads like, how, how did we get here? Yeah. You know, how did they just say, okay, we can overturn Roe? Um, and well, so pro-life people are trying to f f uh, understand right. that. The pro-abortion people are trying to understand it even more because they're just, they're just, their well, they're are, out, of control. out of control. But you know, the problem with them is they don't want to stop and listen. No, they don't. They just want to chant and shout and scream. Yeah. You know, I saw uh, on the news this morning uh, that, here there are some people saying now they're not going to celebrate Independence Day because they're not proud to be Americans because of this decision. Oh, this decision gives us a lot of freedom. It doesn't take a policy position on abortion. They, right. they seem to think that the court ruled in favor of, of pro-lifers. The didn't. policy, that the, the decision doesn't take a policy position on abortion. Right. It says work it out. You are free. Basically, the decision it's is free. Said, you are free now yeah. to set policy on yeah. this. And, and really, Independence Day will be now Independence for the Unborn. Born, That's right. They could be championing and holding their little American flags going, we have a chance now. We have a yeah, chance. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. OK, so, Father, let's get going. I think you have a question. On well, yes. The, the, you know, we're going through this page by page. Right. And the section we come to now after the uh, decision explained why there is not a constitutional right to abortion. Right. Then they look at stare decisis. In other words, this idea that, well, wait a minute. We ruled on this many times. The court has ruled dozens of times on abortion. That's just the Supreme Court. You know, right. when you take into account the other courts, hundreds and hundreds of cases, right? right? Uh -huh. So dozens of times the Supreme Court has ruled on abortion. And, you know, since 1973, every one of these decisions has been in line with Roe v. Wade, even though they have changed it in, in, in serious ways. And we're going to see even today how some of the ways that even Casey changed row but the bottom line is stare decisis let the things that have been decided stand right and now i want to look at what did this decision say about why they decided to reverse roe v wade why did they change it let's go to the board roe and casey right they changed right. them both and we're going to look at the, the, the basically they analyzed it and they said there's five reasons why we're doing so let me put all five here on the board. Number one, okay, the nature of the error, okay, of the error in Roe and Casey. Number two, the weakness of the reasoning. You look at Roe and at Casey and how they justified their positions, it's weak, okay? You shouldn't be, nobody who supports these decisions should be proud of the reasoning. Number three, <coughs> the unworkability of the standard. So we'll explain what that means. They set a standard for evaluating, for courts to evaluate pro-life laws. Well, Janet, that standard is unworkable. It's confusing. It's been applied inconsistently. It's self-contradictory. It's subjective. It's problematic. <coughs> right. Okay. Two other reasons. And number four, the um, harm done to other areas of the law. We'll just give you an example or two. Other areas <coughs> mm -hmm. of the law. It's what we call the abortion distortion. Okay. When it comes right. to abortion, all the rules change. Oh, all okay? logic out the window. Yeah, it, it is. 
And finally, there's no reliance interest, uh, as uh, Casey tries to pretend. There's no reliance interest here on abortion. So these, in a nutshell, are the five reasons that the decision gives. So, so for, Father, in the decision itself, they use these words? This yes. This is their words. Yes. Like, and what, is it done like in parts? Like yes. first, the nature of the error, and then they go into that. That's right. Ah, That's okay. right. This is going to be good. It's this done It's good. it's done very, very much in detail. So let's I see. This is how they're picking apart stare decisis. Yes. Understand? Because what you just explained okay, because it's always been this way, we keep it this way, but they're saying, no, 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 no. Here's the reasons why we don't have to go along with stare decisis, right? Yes, because stare decisis, brothers and sisters, let me put the words up here. It's two Latin words. Stare means to stand, and decisis means with the things that have been decided. Stand with the things that have been decided. The, 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 the court has never considered this a dogma. It's not an unchangeable dogma. It's not, as, as the court has used the words, an inexorable command. And by the way, Justice Barrett said that in the oral arguments. Uh, uh, it is not um, an absolute, it's not a straitjacket. That's another term that they've used. It's not a straitjacket. So in other words, a court can change its precedence. A court can change even a longstanding precedent. And that's, in fact, what it does here. Why it does it is what these five reasons explore. So let's say, Janet, a little bit more about each of these things. We'll come back to these last four, but let's look at number one. We'll look at them one at a time. And like you said, Janet, the, the decision, that's why it's so long, uh, explains each one of these and gives, in, gives examples and, goes, and gives reasoning and quotes other decisions of the court from the past. And it's really, really so far, uh, well written. So, Father, in this section... This was written by Alito, correct? Uh, yeah, he's the chief author, he's yes. He's the chief author. So what it means is the other justices that, that concurred with him, yeah. they liked what he did. They didn't see exactly. a need to like, oh, I want to change this sentence. Well, they may have given him input uh, right. you know, when the thing was being put together. Right, but right, yeah, right. they all agree with it. In other words. They that, all signed right. on to it. They all signed yeah. on to it. Yeah, okay. uh, well, when we say all. Uh, uh, Five. Uh, 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 Five. Uh, the, uh, Alito, right. the three Trump justices, okay, right, right, Kavanaugh, right. Gorsuch, and right. Barrett, and of course, our friend Justice Thomas. Uh, well, and you know something, Father? Even this morning on Fox News, right, Steve Dush, Dush was saying, oh, and they, they overturned Roe by, uh, he's still, they're still saying six to three. That even, uh, yeah, technically that's technically, not Technically that's, not true. that's yeah. not true. It's five to four. Five to four, yeah. Yeah. It's like they don't even understand what, what went on. You know what well, I mean? Well, again, well, uh, all right. So you bring up that point. So so it was five to four to reverse a row in Casey. It was six to three to uphold Mississippi. the Mississippi law. Right, yes, right. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So. Which, of course, some would say, and in looking at the, the the arguments carefully, I would say, too, if you uphold that Mississippi law, even if you say nothing else, you have effectively reversed Roe and Casey because at the heart of them is something we'll actually talk more about tomorrow, and that is that viability line. That's okay? right. Yeah. Uh, at the heart of these cases, it's like, whoa, wait a second. How can you uphold Roe and Casey and strike down the, the viability uh, uh, barrier? I don't know. It's not, it, 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 if you still uphold Roe and Casey after that, you're upholding like a shadow of them, a right. shadow. I mean, they're yeah. so weak. They're so weak. All right. Well, all let's right. Go. So, so okay. the nature of the error, not all errors are created equal. And, and the court points out that, you know, the nature of the error, this is a fundamental moral concern of millions and millions of citizens. In other words, sometimes the court rules on things and you look at it and you say, what is that? You know, it's right. like technical points of the law, nuances of the Constitution. It's like, what is that? And it may be things that apply only to a very, very, very small segment of the public, right. not on fundamental moral issues, uh, et cetera. Right. But this is on a fundamental issue that is is impacting tens of millions of Americans, if not more, and, and, that, and that even more than that are concerned about every day. Um, it goes really to the heart. I mean, it's a matter of life and death, right? I mean, it's, right. it's, it's so not all cases are, um, going so deep to the core of the, of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the issue. And not only that, but what the court has done here is, um, 
is uh, uh, short circuited the democratic process. Okay, so they, and they make a, a important point uh, of this. Let me just put it on here: short circuit democratic process, meaning what? Meaning that the court imposed a policy on abortion on the entire nation, a policy that they are saying is an interpretation of the Constitution, a policy, furthermore, that they are saying, because it's an interpretation of the Constitution, the people can't change it through the legislative process. Right. Okay, You can't have a vote in your state legislature to get rid of freedom of speech. Right? You can't have a vote in your state legislature. Let's pass a law that abolishes freedom of religion. You can't do that. It's a constitutional provision, and the constitutional law overrides any other kind of laws in this nation because every lawmaker, including state lawmakers, take an oath to uphold what? The, the Constitution. Constitution. Okay, so even President Biden. Oh uh, yeah, well, it'd be nice if you read the, the, read I know. the document. Okay, so this short circuiting and democratic process, it's just a grievous error that the court made. And this is one of the reasons, Janet, one of the things that the decision says is that stare decisis, okay, and let, let, I want to help people understand this simple point, is weakest when it comes to constitutional interpretation. Not every case is about constitutional interpretation. This one is. Now, why is stare decisis weakest at that point? In other words, why should the court be more willing than usual to reverse stare decisis, to reverse its past decisions on cases that have to do with constitutional interpretation? The reason is because that's the only recourse the people have short of amending the Constitution, right. which, of course, is a very, very hard process, and rightly so. In other words, if you're saying, here's what the Constitution means, oh, well, I guess we have to follow that. Every legislator in the country has to follow it. Every judge in the country, in every court in the country, on every issue in the country has to follow that. It's like, well, wait a second. If, that's what be, if you're saying that's what the Constitution means, we're really stuck with that. Even judges, you know, who disagreed with Roe v. Wade, you know, they had to follow what Roe v. Wade said. Well, what's the recourse against that? If it's wrong, if it's a wrong interpretation, how do you fix that? Well, either the justices have to recognize it was wrong and fix it, which is what they did in the Dobbs case, or you have to amend the Constitution. Right. Well, that's that's going to take an awful lot of that's consensus, <laughs> work and time, right. et cetera. Okay, so the nature of the error, that's reason number one. Okay, let's go to reason number two of why the court decided to overturn Roe and Casey. And that is the weakness of the arguments, the weakness of the reasoning. Reason number two. Weakness of the reasoning. You read Roe v. Wade, you got to be ashamed, okay? <laughs> the history is garbage. They used serial means... Pro-abortion attorney, you watch the movie Roe, v, Roe versus Wade, you'll see right. Cyril in Which, there. Which, by the way, Father, uh, just so our people know, that Roe v. Wade movie, you can get it on Fox Nation. They have it as one of the options oh, to watch good. the whole. Uh -huh. th Matter of fact, I watched it with my good friend Mary Kaminsky. Oh, good. Just a few weeks ago to refresh my memory about the movie. Yeah. I highly recommend it because it really shows all the bad reasoning and all the political stuff the political intrigue yeah that the justice yeah. was going yeah, through exactly you know? I mean, I, 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 yeah that's right and two of them had family members that volunteered for planned parenthood that's right so there was a real underhanded stuff going on <laughs> well cyril was um like i say he was an attorney for NARAL, pro-abortion attorney um uh, who <coughs> He had some historical theories that were novel, novel historical theories that since then have been debunked, okay? And yet, Blackman quotes him seven times in Roe v. Wade. Wow. And no other historian. Let this sink in, brothers and sisters. No other historian. Roe v. Wade talks about ancient philosophies 
and ideas about abortion. And doesn't talk about the history of the United States dealing with abortion, its own abortion laws at the time that the 14th Amendment was adopted. It completely skips over and ignores that and talks about, instead about the ancient philosophers and theologians. What? What? This is well, garbage. I mean, Father, this right is... there. there. Blackman quotes seven times a NARAL pro-abortion attorney. I mean, that is so underhanded right there. And then it gets He's worse. He's got an agenda. And then it gets worse because when it comes to the science of Roe v. Wade. Right. And that, and by the way, if people want to read about the science of Roe v. Wade getting debunked, the, our good friend Dr. Thomas Hilgers, his book, about the, the the crazy nonsense of the science of Roe v. Wade yeah. is a, a must read. <laughs> oh, yeah, because, yeah, that's right. Hildreth goes into he, this. He goes into it. Yeah. He quotes a freelance journalist. What? For the science. Oh, my goodness. A name, Janet, that you know, Larry Later. Oh, Larry Later. Oh, yeah. But see, Larry, he's, see, that's, this is a real scam, Father. It's a scam. To quote Larry Later, Larry Later was partnered with Dr. Bernard Nathanson. They were scheming in New York in the late 60s, and, and, and by 1970, they got abortion legal in New York State. Larry Later has, you know, he was taking vacations with Nathanson, scheming and plotting. Yeah. And that's who they quote. And they, and, and he quotes Larry Later, okay, eight times. Oh, my goodness. Later, Nathanson and Later made up, up statistics that they were floating to the media. All right, but. Yeah, Dr. What? Nathanson himself said about the women that are dying and back out of abortions. He goes, oh, Larry and I were sitting around talking, and we came up with a number, 10,000. And, and, and Larry laughed and said, yeah, that's a good number. We'll use that. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's their statistical this is the weak. This is the strength of the reasoning. But the Dobbs case <laughs> goes, uh, goes into uh, another basic aspect of this, more basic, more fundamental. And that is Roe, okay, legislated. They had this sophisticated trimester framework. Oh, the state cannot interfere with the abortion decision in the first trimester. At the end of the first trimester, the state's interest in preserving the woman's health becomes compelling, and so it can pass laws about her health in the second trimester. At the end of the second trimester, the state's interest in the developing baby becomes compelling, and so if they want, they don't have to, they can prohibit abortion. And, and it's like, okay, where did you get all this? What reason do you have in the Constitution for setting those trimester uh, um, barriers? And the answer is there is no basis in the Constitution for setting up this trimester framework. Roe is doing something here, as Dobbs points out, that you would expect from whom? legislators. Right. If a legislature got together and had hearings, received expert testimony, debated, amended, and came up with this kind of framework, you know, we have legislative findings now, and here's what we're doing, and here's why we're doing it. This is the kind of thing, Janet, that you would expect from a legislature, not from a court. A court is supposed to be looking at the Constitution. A court is supposed to be looking at other laws that were already written through the legislative process. Roe is very, very weak because it lays out this framework as if it were a legislature and doesn't give any constitutional basis for doing so. So that is, is another aspect of the weakness. And then just to look at Casey, because Dobbs is overturning both Roe and Casey. Well, and also, too, um, we're not having mentioned that de facto would also overturn Doe. Yes. You know, Dovey Bolton also went yes. at the same time. Dovey Bolton, which gave this elaborate definition about what health means. Again, no reference to the Constitution, but, you know, oh, it includes the woman's age, family considerations, etc. Psychological, et yeah. this, that. That's all thing. overturned, uh, uh, too. Also, right. Casey comes up with a new standard. Casey, <laughs> you see, you talk, uh, let's consider something here. You're talking about stare decisis. Roe is precedent, 50 years. Oh, we have to respect that. We have to hold on to that. Friends, Casey didn't even respect it. Understand something. 
the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision partially in 1992 reversed Roe, partially reversed Roe. It abandoned the framework of the trimester, that, 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 that legislative looking schema I just outlined. It got rid of it. It changed the underlying reasoning of Roe from privacy because remember, we explained to you before, Roe said, yeah, the right to abortion, it's rooted there in the Constitution. You know, it's somewhere there, we feel. They actually use the word feeling. It's somewhere there in the first, fourth, fifth, ninth, 14th Amendment. It's lurking in there somewhere. This is ridiculous. <laughs> that is crazy. This is not an argument. <laughs> nope. But Casey said, okay, you know what? We're going to settle with the 14th Amendment. So in other words, they... <laughs> They didn't endorse, Casey decision didn't even endorse the reasoning of Roe. They moved from privacy to liberty. They right. said, yeah, you know, maybe we ought to, you know, <clears throat> identify this a little bit more. And we talked about already the 14th Amendment and liberty. But Casey partially reversed Roe. It reversed two other abortion-related decisions of the Supreme Court, um, on which relied on Roe, okay, Akron in 83 and Thornburg, in, uh, Akron was 83, and Thornburg in 86. These were abortion-related decisions relating to some of the things Casey was deciding relative to the Pennsylvania law, but they overturned them. What I'm saying is, you know, you got the court making all these changes. The end result is always the same. People can kill babies, but in the womb, but the reason the rationale is is all over the map so casey comes up with this new standard undue burden okay so janet let's <laughs> let's erase this here okay. undue burden can you tell me what that means can anybody tell me what that means can the judge tell <laughs> us what that means can anybody say what that means undue burden what you consider a burden i might not what you consider undue i well, might what not what they were trying to say they, father is that you know if a woman feels Having a baby at this time is such a burden. It's too burdensome. I, yeah. I, oh, I can't d deal with this. Then you can have an abortion. Well, well, I mean, what they're what, what they're getting at saying. here is what they're getting <clears throat> at here is is a standard to, for evaluating a law, and it's saying does that law introduce a substantial obstacle in the way of her getting that abortion? Okay, it, 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 for example, is a 24-hour waiting period, too much of a burden, burden Okay, right. for her to get an abortion. Uh, does the law introduce a substantial obstacle? Well, you see, again, another object, a subjective term here, substantial. What's substantial? It doesn't work. So, again, and, and, and undue burden also relies on viability because it says you can't put an undue burden in her way to getting an abortion you can't put a substantial obstacle prior to viability here's the point where in the constitution do they get all this it's not there nowhere okay. okay not only janet not only is abortion not in the constitution undue burdens not in the constitution viability is not in the constitution these people are making things up out of thin air and that's why the dobbs this case is saying look we're we're pledged to uphold the constitution can we get back to some common sense here and if you're going to make things up like this if you're going to set standards you know isn't that the job of lawmaking if you're going to weigh and balance the interests of um the baby versus those of the mother in other words uh, both of these decisions that they reversed, that Dobbs reversed, taught, used viability as the dividing line, okay? And they said after that, <coughs> uh, baby's rights in the womb can be considered. Are compelling, right. But again, compelling. Father, viability but is a moving target. It is. I mean, at the time of Roe, viability was about 28 weeks. Now we're about 20, I think most scientists 22, say 22, 22 to 24, 23. depending on what scientists you want to go by. Mm. And who knows in the next few years what viability will be. I mean, because the way of treating the, the babies in NICU keeps improving and improving, you know? Well, here's the thing. Both Roe and Casey, and here's again, this is an aspect of the weakness of these decisions. They say, they admit that the state okay, has interests. What are the state's interests? Well, 
Now, if a state has an interest, in other words, they can pursue that interest by passing a law, right? A law outlawing abortion, for example. Okay. What are the state's interests, Janet? In the baby in the womb, okay. Then you may use other terms, potential life, whatever. Infant life. Infant infant life life is another one. Yes, that's right. And in the mother's health. Right. Now, these are not the only interests, but there, there are, these are two of the big ones, okay, right? Okay, so in other words, Dobbs is looking at this now, uh, 20 years after Casey, right? And, uh, and is saying, oh, wait a second. Um, if the state has an interest in the life of the baby, now you've got to try to think like a judge here. You're looking at the Constitution, right? Then why would that interest be compelling after viability, but not equally compelling before viability? In other words, Dobbs is looking back and asking Casey, okay, it's like like the court engaging in a self-reflection and literally engaging in a repentance here and saying, well, if the state has an interest, what basis do you have for saying it only kicks in in a compelling way after viability, why doesn't that baby have just as much an interest in his or her life before viability? What about when the heart beats? Uh, right. Right. And the and the bottom line is that what Dobbs is saying is let me let me let me make very clear here what Dobbs is saying. Dobbs is saying we have no reason. We see no reason based in the Constitution, that's point number one, we see no constitutional basis for this, these, 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 these lines that they're drawing, right? Constitutional <laughs> Come on, Father. basis. Uh-huh. <clears throat> um, and furthermore, we aren't the ones who should decide. Exactly. Right. Okay. Because the remember, both sides are making arguments here, obviously. The pro-lifers are saying, hey, the baby has a right to life. Pro-abortion people are saying, hey, the mother has a right to choose. And the court is saying, well, then bring these competing arguments into the legislatures. Right. Okay. So this is point number two. Let me move a little more quickly here. The weakness of the reasoning was reason number two. Number three, unworkability. And Janet, let's just give an example. We lived through this. Mm -hmm. Um, The unworkability of this standard that they set in Casey. Okay. If, look, if you're going to stick with stare decisis, if you're going to stick with decisions in the past that the court has made, there is a reason for that. Number one, I mean, no judge should think that you know, he or she is, you know, the, the, the be all and end all of judicial reasoning. You kind of have to have a little bit of humility and realize, hey, other people just as smart or smarter than I am as have think through this before, have thought through this before. They've reasoned through it. They've come to their decision. Let me kind of acknowledge that a little bit. Secondly, you don't want to encourage people every time there's a decision they don't like from the court. But let's just go back tomorrow and relitigate it. You know, let's bring another case against it. There's got to be something, some weight. There's got to be some value to something that the court already decided. And, uh, and, and, and thirdly, you know, people have to have some kind of confidence that, you know, we're moving forward in a consistent way with these laws and these understandings of the Constitution. So stare decisis is meant, and, 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 it, and it, it is very, very important, to produce a a stable development of the law. Stable, consistent, predictable. You know, there's got to be some predictability when a dispute arises as to how the court is going to adjudicate it. And uh, so, yeah, there's a value to that. The point that Dobbs is making is that the standards we have on abortion have proven to be, to have proven to have inconsistent results and applications and unpredictable outcomes, right, Janet? And, and, and so the point here is, for example, the Supreme Court itself, the justices on the court applied the undue burden standard to partial birth abortion in the year 2000, 
we saw the court strike down a Nebraska law on partial birth abortion. Three of the justices there who had brought us the undue burden standard applied it differently in that case. And then the court reversed its position on partial birth abortion seven years later. And again, you had justices disagreeing on what was an undue burden and what wasn't. It doesn't work. It's not so clear. It's not objective because it's not defined. Like we said before, what's undue to one in one person's judgment might not be in another's. And there are all kinds of other examples. In other words, the judges, what this is saying, the judges are confused as to how to evaluate laws relating to abortion. So they come to different conclusions. It's unworkable as a standard. So they're throwing the standard out. A fourth reason is other areas of the law get distorted. Um, Janet, look, what was the case um, that our friend Joe Scheidler uh, had to deal with, right? Oh, yeah. That was how many times now, did he, now versus Scheidler. How many times did he, he have to go to, to the, the Supreme s- Court? Three times till he finally uh, got victory. <laughs> And yeah, this was dealing with... Uh, the National Organization for Women was suing Joe Scheidler of the Pro-Life Action League of being a racketeer, of interfering with the business of the abortion industry by his peaceful protesting and encouraging peaceful protesting and trying to reach women outside of abortion clinics. They took on Joe Scheidler and said... Where we took it all the way to the court and three times, three times. Now, to put people through this kind of of, (laughs) uh, judicial um, uh, workout, okay, shouldn't be necessary when it comes to basic First Amendment rights of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. They were being peaceful, okay? But this is an example of what we call the abortion distortion. Distortion. When it comes to other areas of the law, When it comes to abortion, the normal rules do not apply. Let me give you one other example. There's something called third-party standing. Let's say I don't like the way you're being treated or the way a law is uh, affecting you. So I'm going to go knock on the door of the court and I'm going to say, hey, John or Jane out there isn't being treated the right way. And you know what the court's going to say to me? Who the heck are you? If, if their rights are being violated, they can just jolly well march over to the court themselves and ask for their own rights. Who are you? You don't have standing. They're going to ask me, are you being harmed by the law? No, 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 John, my friend John. Well, then let John come to the court. Okay. That's, this, is the, this is the doctrine of third-party standing. You don't go to the court for somebody else, okay? You go to the court to claim your own rights or your own, that you claim that you've been harmed. Okay. Now, there are certain narrow exceptions to that if somebody has a very, 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 very close relationship with somebody else, an intimate relationship, and that somebody else, for some reason, is not capable of speaking for themselves or going to the court, then the courts will allow it. But that's it. Except in the area of abortion. Except in the area of abortion. Because the abortionists march into court saying, our clients, the women who come to us for abortions, have these rights and those rights. Well, who are you? Let them come. Okay? So this is just just two examples. You know, free speech, First Amendment, third-party standing. There's other things, facial challenges, what's called severability. Those of you that know constitutional law know what these things are. It all gets distorted when it comes to abortion. Okay, so Janet, that was area number four. It's bringing damage to all these other areas of the law. We've got to get back to common sense and to our, 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 our longstanding understanding of these provisions of the law. And finally, no reliance interest. In fact, Casey admitted in the traditional sense of reliance, when you have a law, let's say it's a law regarding contracts. <coughs> You know, well, you, you rely on those contracts, you know, to, 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 be, to be adjudicated the right way. Um, uh, but when it comes to, to things like abortion, well, these circumstances are going to come up upon you in an unexpected way, unplanned pregnancy, by the very fact that it's unplanned. It was unforeseen. 
So you're not talking about the traditional kind of reliance. We say women rely on abortion. Casey came up with this novel idea. Is some kind of, well, vague, you know, sort of women have come to plan their lives and their intimate relationships based on the availability of abortion. And you know what Dobbs said about this, Janet? They said, they basically said, how, okay, can we, the court, evaluate these things? Yeah. And again, the, 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 let me read, a, there's, there's, there's a great... Um, uh, quote here about this, uh, about this, that quote, this was from a, another Supreme Court decision. Um, courts do not substitute their social and economic beliefs for the judgments of legislative bodies. Again, a similar theme like we've been seeing all through this. Let the legislatures figure this out. Courts can't substitute their judgments for those of the legislative bodies. But that's what they've been doing when they, whenever they've applied Casey to, to cases that are challenging pro-life laws. The, the legislators made a judgment already about how much people rely on abortion and whether we can pass this law to limit it. And meanwhile, then the court is coming and substituting its judgment on a social issue for the judgment the legislators already made. That's why, they're Janet, they're throwing this out. And let me go back to the chair here now. You know, because the briefs, some of the very powerful briefs in the Dobbs case pointed this out. There's one other point. Women have been advancing in society. Right. Women's advancement has been increasing, even while abortion has been decreasing. decreasing. Right. So how can their advancement depend upon the availability of abortion? Right. If abortions have been going down and women's involvement in society has been going up. So those are the five reasons in a Right, and, and so nutshell. many things have changed since Roe for women. Yes. You know, I mean, back when we had Roe, I mean, uh, I, I can remember even in, in the 60s, if a teacher got pregnant, they uh, they lost their job. They, they had to leave once they started to show in their pregnancy. I mean, then the government started passing laws gradually that, you know, you couldn't fire a pregnant woman. She was allowed to, and they had to give some maternity leave. Uh, I mean, so much has improved. The pregnancy centers alone is such a great example uh, that 2,800 pregnancy centers all over our country uh, yeah, yeah. are here. And they give, it's not just about diapers and formula. We're talking about medical expenses, a place to live if necessary, job opportunities. They help them not just have the baby, but get back into society. And they've become medical clinics. Yeah, now, medical clinics. Now. They go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Planned This Parenthood. was not the case at the time of Casey this was not certainly Casey not at the time or, of Roe. No, because I can remember back when we first uh, started getting very active, Father. I mean, the, the number of pregnancy centers was just beginning to, yeah. to increase, just mm -hmm. beginning. Yeah. Now it's mushrooming all over the well, place. Well, it outnumbered the abortion <laughs> facilities almost four to one. Four to one. Yeah, yeah. You know, so all these reasonings don't exist. And, you know, my challenge to all these companies now who want to pay between four and $10,000, Father, to let a, a woman travel to go have an abortion, right? What is, what's the what's the maternity leave policies for those same companies? Right. Why don't we why don't we just get real in our country? Like uh, over in Scandinavia, they give maternity leave. The state provides the federal governments of the Scandinavian countries one year maternity leave. Nice. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if the Biden, you know, Biden administration, instead of worrying about, oh, can, can we provide abortions on federal land instead in, in states that ban abortion? Instead of worrying about that, Mr. Biden, President there. Why don't you worry about empowering and giving more maternity leave through the federal government for, for moms so they can stay home for months and months and months with that unborn child? Yeah. And why don't these companies that want to help fund abortion help fund maternity leave more? Yeah, exactly. You know, see, the problem is fine. And, and one more step, Father. All the taxpayer money that goes to Planned Parenthood why don't they at least split it? You want to have choice 50-50. Let's give half to the pregnancy center movement and half to Planned Parenthood. They won't even do that. Mm -hmm. To me, that's choice, Father. Mm -hmm. Real choice. So, yeah, uh, exactly. But there was one more question that we keep getting um, uh, from, from our people. I just Before we go, Father, if you could just address this question. There's concern right now. They're hearing about some federal judges mm -hmm. in states where they have the trigger laws 
they're trying to uh, put in some kind of injunctions stopping the trigger laws from from taking effect. They're always the pro-abortions pe right. people <clears throat> are always going to find pro-abortion judges right. who will try anything. They're desperate. <clears throat> But I don't think that uh, they're ultimately going to prevail on a widespread scale here. you got to look at each case, of right. course, uh -huh. and see, are they invoking the state constitution or are they invoking the federal constitution? One thing is for sure, they're not going to be able to rely on Roe v. Wade anymore. Oh. These judges are going to have to get creative and, and you know, these, these uh, pro right. boards and find some other reasons. And that's why I, we've said all along here that part of the battle now post-Roe is going to be on the level of the state courts and the state constitutions. The state courts will try to claim there's a basis in the state constitution mm -hmm. for blocking the law. Right. I don't know how far they're going to get with that because I think a lot of the same arguments that are in Dobbs need to be applied on the state level. If, there's, if the word abortion is not in their constitution, right. if it's not in the history of their state, well, then how are we supposed to evade the problem of of um, state judges or even federal judges, if it comes to that, imposing their views on the people of that state who have already spoken through their elected representatives. That's right. Right. Yeah. I mean, the only way you avoid that is if you can point to, well, this has been in the history and tradition of our state, the right. deeply rooted history. But Dobbs has already shown a right to abortion has not been in the deeply rooted history of, of our, all of America. Exactly. So how are you going to claim a right to abortion in a state constitution if it's not there in your history? Well, what you're ending up doing now is you're sub substituting, again, the, just, the, the judgment and preferences and policies of that judge. Mm -hmm. People don't want that anymore. You're yeah. substituting that for the judgment of the people. Let the people decide. That's where we're and at. And so, Father, that brings us back to an important point. The midterm, the midterm elections in November, we know it's very important for the House and the Senate, obviously, but and, and your local state legislator, right? But there's another important fact here, Father. Judges. In a lot of states, there's judges on the ballot. And I see very often people don't know what to do. They kind of check them off like willy Yeah, almost like a uh, oh, uh, guessing game. Guessing game, yeah. <laughs> But you can research them. Oh, absolutely. And I'm going to tell everyone, we've got to do our homework. You've got to look up those judges. You see who's endorsed them mm -hmm. for this judgeship. That gives you a clue of the kind of judge they're going to be. Yeah. And so we've got to get serious all the way down the ballot, really doing our homework and checking before we, we got to value our vote and be very serious. Oh, this yes. November. This is this November gives us a big chance here. To yeah. keep... So they need to go to ProLifeVote.com. Pro Join vote. our Pro election vote. team. And That's in right. final thing, Father, just of to course. remind everybody, of course. if you want to read more so you can be educated, this is my brand new book. Everything you need to know about abortion for teens. And I'm telling you, you grown-ups are going to learn something too. Beautiful pictures of the unborn child are inside starting at seven weeks. This is a great tool. And guess what? We spoke about Larry Leda. I go into that whole garbage about Larry Leda and Nathanson in this book. So you'll really know about it. Now Just go to abortionandteens.com. Place an order today. I'll personally autograph it for you. And this is like my homework assignment for you. While we're doing these classes on Dobbs, this will also sure you up with some more basic information well, because well, the, well, Janet, the topic is being discussed. And like you always point out, we're not just telling people what anybody who reads up on this stuff can tell them about what Later did and what Nathanson did. We knew Nathanson. We talked to Nathanson right. about later and yes. about Cyril Means and about all this garbage. This garbage. They these were lies. making it all up. They I'll never forget when he, he said he said to us one time, <laughs> so "Where did we get the statistics about how many out women were dying?" Air, he he said, went. Oh, he put his hands up in the air. I don't. He air. said, "I don't know." Out of thin yeah. air. Yeah, we made them up. We made it up. I mean, we so. knew these guys. Yeah. And and it's like okay, that's why, you know, they need to watch these programs, read this book. It's more than just, hey, everybody, here's what happened. No, no. We're talking from our Experience. personal interaction. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Beautiful. thanks, Father. We'll All right. Again, another class. Very good. Okay. Well, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us. We went a little bit longer than usual, but this topic is so important. Join us again also tomorrow night. Class number five will be in session. Bring your questions, and I hope you're finding it useful. Don't forget to tell others to watch and go to SupremeCourtVictory.com. That's where all the information will be placed. And again, 
Janet Moran, Executive Director of Priest Life. Thank you and God bless. I will be so-